Hello and welcome to this Know More About session looking at predatory publishers. This is a growing problem for a lot of researchers and one that is often quite confusing to people if you don't know what to watch out for. So these are the topics that we're going to cover in this session. We're going to look at what predatory publishers are and why in fact the term predatory is itself a bit of a problem. We're going to talk about why they're an issue and why they might actually be considered a viable business model by some people. And then we're going to finish off by looking at some of the major warning signs to watch out for and then go through a checklist that you can use to assess any publisher or offer to publish your work. Underneath this video you should see in the notes a section on topics and timings. Clicking on any of those links will take you straight to the relevant section of the session if you don't want to watch the whole video. So we need to start with defining what predatory publishers actually are, and that's not as clear cut as you might hope it is. We also need to take a slight step back and acknowledge that there are some problems using the term predatory. It is quite a loaded term. People um, disagree whether it should be used or not, and it might not actually be completely appropriate to describe some of these business practices. However, we have chosen to call this session Predatory Publishers because that is what most people know these um, publishers as. When they're searching for help on this topic, that's the term that they most often use. A lot of the reason for that is down to a man called Jeffrey Beale, and you see his definition of these publishers on the screen there. He is an academic librarian from Colorado, I believe, in the US, and he um, popularized the term predatory publisher because he maintained a list of those publishers who, in his own words there, he considered unprofessionally exploited the gold open access model for their own profit, which meant that they charged researchers for publishing their work. They claimed it was so that work could be released immediately open access, but they didn't actually provide the services. They were just taking the money. He maintained this list for a few years. It was quite popular in the academic community. However, it was not very popular with some publishers, some publishers that may be considered a problem and some publishers that may be considered legitimate publishers because they didn't actually like their names and their titles appearing on this list because it wasn't very good for business. So Jeffrey Beale himself came under quite a lot of pressure to have that list removed. He did take it down eventually. You can still find it if you know where to look online, but the actual official list is no more and he has actually stepped down from his role largely as a consequence of the backlash that he got from running that service. And that does highlight a little bit the dangers of a question that we frequently get asked when dealing with these types of publishers is that why can't you just give us a list of the ones that are good and the ones that are bad? Well, Jeffrey Beale was sharing the ones that he thought were bad in his opinion. He did make mistakes. He was just one person doing this. And also he um, came in for a lot of legal problems. But the main reason that at Cambridge, at least, we don't give our researchers a list of the publishers that are good or bad is that the university doesn't um, want to influence your decision about where to publish in any way. would rather take the approach of giving you the tools to make your own decisions. So moving on to the next definition, it's from someone called Peaches Udoma, who is connected to the Open Access Week movement, which is a, funnily enough, week-long celebration of open access, which takes place every October. And she terms these publishers as those which operate on an exploitative business model. And then the uh, final definition there is from Wikipedia, again, following along the same sort of lines an exploitative open access publishing model that involves charging fees to authors without providing any of the services associated with legitimate journals. And you'll notice that the word exploit keeps coming up in these definitions, and that's not a coincidence. Even though it's, it's quite hard for people to agree on exactly what, how to define these publishers, they do all talk in terms of exploitation, and that's because these publishers exist 
to take advantage of the slight confusion around what open access is, the different models. Researchers know they have to pay some money in order to make something open access, but usually that money does go towards running a legitimate publisher and, and doing some editorial services such as peer review. These publishers that we're talking about here, the problem ones, don't tend to perform those services. They just take the money and publish the research as is, which, as we'll go on to talk about, can be a problem. I just want to conclude um, looking at the definitions with uh, this one, which is the latest definition. It only came out a couple of months ago from the journal Nature. You'll see it's quite long. Again, um, there is no official consensus from all corners of the world about what a predatory publisher is, and you'll notice that they do use the term predatory in their definition. This definition is the result of three focus groups and 18 hours of discussion amongst multiple people in order just to get to this point, and this is not the most concise definition in the world. So although it does demonstrate some kind of consensus, it also shows that there is still some degree of disagreement about these um, publishers and what the issue is. However, it does follow broadly the same lines. And instead of talking about exploitation, it talks about prioritizing self-interest of the publisher at the expense of scholarship. And I think this is what is key with these publishers, that they prioritize making money for their business at the expense of releasing decent scholarship into the world. So although there is a lack of definition about exactly what these publishers are, there is quite a lot of agreement on kind of the characteristics that you need to watch for. So typically they will solicit manuscripts directly from the researcher. Usually newer researchers, researchers who've maybe only just published for the first time, you will get an email out of the blue asking you to consider publishing with one of these titles. These emails are often very flattering. They'll use a lot of flattering language. They'll tell you how wonderful your research is, how exciting they found it, how they really want to publish your future works, things like that, which in an academic ecosystem which does favor publication, and the more publications you have, the better researcher you're seen to be, it can be a very, very tempting offer. As I said, they do exploit the lack of understanding about open access publication models to charge for services that they aren't in fact providing. So the big one of these is peer review. Although peer review is carried out for free by um, academics within the um, same research circle, there, it doesn't come without some kind of administrative charge to the uh, publisher. So in theory, some of the, the costs of making something open access will go towards practices such as administering peer review, quality check on the research, um, checking spelling, typesetting, making sure everything's laid out properly, there's no mistakes, all very important things when you're um, putting scholarly research out there. Some of these publishers take it a couple of steps further and they actually misrepresent themselves and what they do. So in the kindest possible way, you could refer to some of these firms as what's known as vanity publishers, which are publishers who take money in return for publishing something. This is typically done if you want to publish um, memoirs and you're not famous, or um, self-published stories or things like that, fiction that you've written and you're, you're not going through a formal publisher for whatever reason, but you've chosen to pay a firm to share your work. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just not typically done for academic scholarly material. These publishers are essentially vanity publishers and that they will take money and publish something, but they are representing it as scholarly work, which is where the problem lies. They also are, well, they tend to be quite secretive about their process or in fact lie about what they do. It can be really hard to find information they may start slipping in the odd extra charge for something that you weren't expecting. These can add up. They're just ever so slightly shady. So it's important at this point, I think, to take a step back and look at open access publishing as a way to fully understand the problem that these predatory publishers bring to the scholarly ecosystem. So from a researcher point of view, and this is incredibly simplified, but from the researcher point of view, 
they publish something, a manuscript, a journal article, for example, and they know that they can pay some money to the publisher in order to make it open access. There's a lot more nuance to open access than just this, but this is maybe kind of the researcher perception. They know there's some money involved somewhere, the actual output will be made openly available, and that's really important, especially in the UK, because work needs to be made openly available in order to count towards the REF, which is our big research um, assessment exercise. The better institutions do in the REF, the more money they get for future research, and on it goes. Predatory publishers exploit this kind of confusion. There's the fact that people know that there's money involved somewhere, but they don't really know why and what it's for by the, charging a, in quotes, open access fee, but they don't actually offer any of the, the services that they, they claim to offer, such as peer review. Now, peer review, you will know if you're a researcher, is the quality control process for the academic work which goes out there. And if it's not done properly, it can lead to problems. So just to show you um, a few problems, these titles or these uh, articles that you're about to see all come from journals which claim to only publish scholarly peer-reviewed research, but were actually found to be predatory problem publishers. The articles you'll see were all submitted as a kind of joke, as a kind of sting operation to expose these publishers as frauds. So the first title we have here actually looks like a very realistic um, medical article from a medical journal. It goes on about um, cells and all kinds of things and it has uh, keywords, it has an abstract, it has full details, corresponding author's address, everything you would expect to see. However, if you delve a little bit deeper, you will see that what it's actually talking about is something called midichlorians, which is what gives the Jedi their powers in Star Wars, which, as most people will know, is fictional, not real, so not necessarily what you would expect to see in a, a reputable medical journal. In fact, if you drill down a little deeper, if you look at the um, author, author names on here, You'll see we've got George L.M., which is actually Lucas McGeorge, I believe, if you look a bit further down. And A. Kin, which is Anakin Skywalker, which again, that's not a real person. And if you um, are really interested, I would recommend having a look at this article and looking through the references online, because that's when it starts to become really obvious, especially when you see um, uh, references to articles written by Obi-Wan Kenobi and H. Solo is when the alarm bells really should start ringing. But that was um, shared as legitimate academic research, which obviously it isn't. Some more examples here. We have one that looks at the role that cocoa extract plays in breakfast cereals, which is not unfortunately as scientific as you would expect it to be. It's written by Orson Welles, which is quite an achievement given that it was published in 2017. Also, Pinkerton the Brain is from a cartoon from the 90s, so he's not a real author either. And then the third example we have here was actually written by two characters from The Simpsons in collaboration with someone who sounds an awful lot like the leader of North Korea. But I doubt any of these people were writing academic articles. These were all submitted for publication in predatory journals. They all made it through to publication. These are screenshots from the websites. They were published as legitimate academic work. Now, it, it might be funny to see these examples. They are humorous, but they do have a serious point because these articles were all shared as rigorously peer-reviewed research. And if this sort of stuff is slipping through, which is obviously a joke, maybe things that aren't so obvious actually aren't being picked up when they're shared as legitimate online research. And that should call into question academic issues around academic integrity, um, how we, we know that research has been actually reviewed and is legitimate, mistakes, genuine mistakes could slip through, falsifications could slip through, people could lie just to get things on their CV, all sorts of problems can happen as a result of this. It generally underm undermines the, um, the whole scientific landscape and actually perpetuates bad research, which is not what we want. 
It can, of course, have an impact on the individual researcher, which is important to consider. This is a question that I often get asked when dealing with these publishers because researchers will say, well, I'm happy to, to publish. What's, what's the problem if it gets my thing out there? I don't care what anyone else has published. OK, but your work may, which is probably very good, very academically sound, very rigorous, is going to be sitting next to rubbish like we saw on the previous slides. So it's going to be sitting next to jokes. Is that really how you want your research to be perceived, sitting alongside a joke? So even if your work is good, is it going to be tainted by association by appearing next to absolute rubbish? It's also worth saying that it's basically a lost chance to publish with a better or more reputable publisher. So there are obviously scales of publisher out there. There are like the gold standard. You might not be able to publish with them, but you shouldn't necessarily just go for one that will take absolutely anything on the basis that you pay them some money because you've put a lot of time and effort into this publication. It's the, the end point of a long project. You could do better. It's a lost chance to publish your work somewhere better that your peers will see it and interact with. Speaking of your peers, it can also, in rare cases, have a long term damage and negative impact on your academic reputation. At best, people will have a bit of a giggle if they've seen you fallen for one of these scams. It certainly won't do you any good. It doesn't add anything to a CV. It doesn't look good on um, promotion or tenure committees or anything like that. It's just basically a bit of a waste of time and actually exposes you as someone who has fallen for a scam, rightly or wrongly. Some predatory publishers are actually taking their tactics a bit further now, which can also uh, damage reputation through no fault of the individual researcher. So what you see here on the screen is a screenshot of an editorial board from a journal, which did turn out to be a predatory journal, spoiler alert. On the face of it, it's a fairly standard screenshot of an editorial board. You've got um, headshots of the people on the board, you've got their names and you've got their research interests, which are all relevant to the journal in question. However, a closer look at certainly these three and the other three may well also be a little um, problematic and may also have been subject to the same problems but these are the only three I could find a solid evidence of. Hopefully um, Cambridge people watching this session will have spotted at least one major problem with this uh, editorial board here. So these three people are not who the journal actually claims them to be. And in fact, they've had their images stolen largely from Cambridge websites. So, for example, um, Dr. Rachel Coop there was currently head of academic planning when this um, picture was taken, this announcement was made. That's exactly the same picture that someone has taken and put under a different name on the editorial board. Rather more boldly and amusingly, they've also stolen the image of the Vice Chancellor of the University and that's again the direct copy of that image there that they put up on the editorial board, which is uh, brave if nothing else, thinking that no one would recognise him. But perhaps my, my favourite example is the third one, which is actually a stock image of manager with business card which has been cropped to look like a headshot. And it just shows you how easy it is for these publishers to compile a reasonably legitimate looking website just by taking material that they find on the internet. So these uh, people are doing absolutely nothing wrong in these photos. There's absolutely nothing wrong with their own academic practices, but they are being used as kind of scapegoats on the editorial board. Now they all had false names. Sometimes, um, these predatory publishers will put people's real names on there instead and say that this real person is um, a member of the editorial board when in fact they know nothing about it. So it can have a different kind of reputational damage. Another issue that I want to highlight at this point is the issue of predatory conferences, which is another way that these um, publishers are starting to branch out their operations. So instead of being invited to publish, a researcher is invited to 
present their work at a conference, in some cases chair a session or even keynote, which again can be really, really flattering, especially if you're at the start of your career. These conferences are often not based in the UK, they're often based somewhere quite far away. So the researcher is expected to fund travel to wherever the conference is being held, but they will use money from their department or their own money because they see it as a chance to enhance their reputation. Unfortunately, when they turn up at the conference, what they're likely to find is that they're stuck in a really rubbish airport hotel with six other conferences also going on at the same time, run by the same company. And what they will find is that the attendees at each conference also double up as the speakers. So you will go and speak to the same six people that have fallen for the same scam that you have. And at this point, you are out of pocket with the same kind of um, damage that we talked about earlier. It does absolutely nothing for your academic rep reputation and it's just a wasted chance to use the money elsewhere. Somewhat more happily after all that uh, bad news is that the academic community and indeed the wider world is starting to pick up on this problem that this is an issue and in fact this kind of came to a head in 2019 when the Omics Publishing Group were taken to court in the US and actually found guilty of deceiving researchers over the services that they provided. So they said that they were providing um, publication services, producing peer-reviewed scholarly output, and in fact, they were found guilty of not doing that, of lying, and told that they had to pay $50 million in damages to the researchers in the case. Whilst the judgment was good because it raised awareness and actually found one of these companies guilty for the first time, because the um, publishing company are not based in the US, it's doubtful whether anyone will actually see the money, but it does at least raise awareness of the problem. So that's the kind of predatory publishers and why they're a problem approach, but there are some people who consider that these publishers actually operate a perfectly legitimate business model. So researchers in different academic cultures, they have different motivations to publish depending on what country you're in, for example. So I know of at least one country where you are expected, if you're going to work in academia, to publish your PhD thesis as a book. That is not always as easy as it sounds if you are prepared to pay and there is a company that's prepared to do it. People argue, well, what's the problem? I need that in order to advance in my career. They are providing the service I need. I'm happy to pay them. Or it could be that you want to add publications to your CV or that you need a certain number of publications on your CV and are, again, happy to pay for this. The actual quality of the research doesn't matter. It's just about numbers, which is its own separate conversation. So it's important to bear in mind that just because you may see it one way, other people may actually operate in a different context. And it does bring up that question about whether the traditional publication model puts too much emphasis on metrics such as um, how many things are published or the, the metrics of a particular journal that something is published in. Should it just be about getting the research out there at the end of the day, it's reaching the same people, so what's the problem? And some people do argue that if there's a need for people to publish and people are offering to do this for a fee, then aren't these publishers just meeting a need that is out there? I don't want to sway opinion either way. There is some argument both for and against this approach, but it is worth bearing in mind that everyone comes to it with a viewpoint of the academic culture that they have been brought up in, if you like, and it's important to think about the wider context. So whichever publisher you end up using for your work, it's important to do some research into their practices. So in this final section of the session, we're going to look at some of the, the warning signs and a kind of a checklist that you can follow to assess publishers. It's really important to say at this point that no, none of these signs should be taken in isolation. Just because a, a publisher scores are negative on one item on the checklist does not necessarily mean that they are a problem. In fact, if you applied these to any of the in quotes legitimate publishers that you 
may come across, so the, the high standard academic publishers, guarantee you they'll fail on at least one of the items on this checklist. So first off, some general warning signs that should maybe raise a red flag that you might have an issue with this publisher. As I said earlier, they do tend to solicit content via email. These emails tend to be overly flattering in their language. They're trying to uh, appeal to your ego, I'm afraid. So both in terms of the language they use and the offer to publish absolutely anything that you care to send them, that may be a warning sign that they're, they're more about the money than they are about producing decent research. However, it's also worth pointing out that that might be a language issue, that it may be someone who, for whom English is not their first language or the language they're approaching you in is not their first language and that they are relying on some kind of translator and the words just come out slightly, slightly wrong. So do have that kind of in the back of your mind. Most legitimate publishers are usually quite selective or specialist, certainly in terms of the topics that they publish on. So if you come across a publisher that publishes on everything, a variety of topics, a range from astronomy to zoology and everything in between, that might again indicate that they're, they're out to make money rather than in it to produce decent research because most publishers will have some kind of subject area definition, although you do get into disciplinary journals, which obviously publish on a range of things. If they ask for any submission fees or other fees that start coming out of the woodwork, these need to be made clear up front. They need to be fully explained what this is for. Otherwise, again, maybe alarm bells should start ringing because this is what some of the slightly dodgier firms do, is that they start charging for things that you might not expect them to charge for, and the costs mount and mount and mount, and you end up paying because you're so far in the publication process and horrible problems ensue. It's worth um, saying that there usually shouldn't be a charge just for submitting work. So submitting it prior to peer review, there shouldn't normally be a charge for someone to look over that. And again, peer review is another big indicator of an issue. So if they offer you a really quick publication time, so I, I myself have had some of these offers where they say, submit um, something to a manuscript to us by the Thursday, we'll have a peer review decision for you by the Monday and we'll publish it again by the following Friday. It's too good to be true. As much as I would like peer review to speed up, that's not the way to do it. If they offer publication times that are too good to be true, it's likely because they're not actually doing any peer review services. They're just taking your manuscript and sticking it up. So if you think back to the examples we saw earlier, you can see that they've just taken what they've been sent with the Star Wars and the serial articles and just put them out online without doing any checks because even the most basic of checks would have uncovered problems with those. So those are some kind of key warning signs and then what follows is a kind of checklist, a more practical checklist that you can use if you've got concerns about a particular publisher. So publishers should be really open about their practices in order to encourage submissions, to make sure they're doing their part to preserve the integrity of research. It should probably talk somewhere about its practices, its philosophy, its reason for publishing in that particular area, perhaps, or selecting the topics that it's selected to publish in, if it's, it's a larger range. So if it's if it's not giving you any of that kind of information, I would potentially ask why that was and do a little bit more digging. A good publisher should also make sure that its contact information is readily available somewhere online. Uh, a couple of tips with this, if it's um, a Gmail address or any other kind of generic email address, I would be a little bit worried. I would expect to see an official email address from an official person. Another thing you can do if you're worried, which um, has sometimes worked, is you can Google the address of the company that it gives on the website and look at it on Google Maps and see what you find. It's not always foolproof, but I have done this before with titles that seemed 
a little bit dodgy and found that they a big publishing house was apparently housed in a suburban bungalow in California, which I found slightly hard to believe. So always worth checking the contact information there. It's not actually unusual for these predatory journals to clone the legitimate name of um, a journal. So the Journal of Physics, for example, a legitimate journal becomes the American Journal of Physics or the, the British Journal of Physics or whatever it is. So there's, it's harder for people to differentiate because they sort of recognize the name. So again, always worth a quick check online. And as I've said before, looking to see if they're publishing on a vast range of topics might indicate that they're in it more for the money than anything else. Any fees that are charged should be clearly explained up front and easy to find. And it's important that you actually understand what it is you're paying for. And that's true no matter how you are going about publishing. So if you're publishing open access and you're being asked for an open access fee, what does this fee actually cover? Be very wary of any hidden fees that crop up. Obviously, that's harder to do up front, but if they keep cropping up, you may be able to stop before you go too far down the rabbit hole. And some authors as well may find that they're subject to hidden fees. And this kind of thing will come up in publication contracts and other documents that you might be asked to sign. So, for example, if you're publishing in a journal, you may be um, obliged then to get your library to subscribe to that journal title for a couple of years, which I can tell you is not going to happen. Or if you're publishing book, you may be um, then obliged by contract to say buy 10 copies, which eats into any any profits that you may make. So just beware if there's any kind of hidden fees that are in there that aren't explicitly stated. Open access publishing often allows authors to retain their copyright through some form of open license. And the type of license or that is available should be made clear and again should be easy to find somewhere on the, the website of the publisher. If it's a Creative Commons or other open license, check that um, this meets with any funder requirements that you might have and check that you're not um, signing away rights to something that might conflict with funder requirements that's really really important and make sure that any of the rights and anything that you as the author retain are laid out on the website or are subject to um, negotiation in the publishing contract somewhere you should be told what your rights are because this is the other thing that happens people um, publish with these predatory titles, they sign away their copyright and that's it, the work is lost. So you need to know what you're getting into and that's good practice with any publisher really. As I keep saying, the big one is the lack of peer review is a major indicator that these publishers are a problem. So you may be starting to sense some kind of theme here with this checklist, but is the process of peer review clearly um, described somewhere? Are you told what the time scales are for this peer review? Is that time scale realistic? If it's too good to be true, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Good peer review takes anything from a few weeks to a few months, depending on the publisher. If it's anything less than that, certainly if it's over a weekend, that should be a major red flag. You might be able to check times from the time of acceptance to publication on the website. So that may um, show you that something was accepted for publication in June and published on the website in July or August, or it may show you that it was published two weeks later, and it may give you more of an indication than the company is forthcoming with. And also check that any metrics like the journal impact factor that are given by the journal are actually correct, especially if they seem quite high and you've never heard of this title before. So as with anything else, members of the editorial board should be listed on the website and easy to find. But if you remember back to the example that we looked at earlier, it's not always the best indication. Look for names of people you know in the field or search for the names of the people on the editorial board. A quick Google would show you that those people on the, the fake editorial board we saw earlier and not who the 
the journal claimed they were. You can use a reverse image search as well if you're unsure and pick up images that way and check that uh, names and images aren't being used without permission. Have a look and see um, if the people on the editorial board list their journal affiliation on their own websites or their department websites. If it's legitimate affiliation, they should have some recognition of it. If you are really, really in doubt of anything, you can contact the person and ask them for their experiences of the journal. This is part of sitting on an editorial board. I do this myself. So if you are unsure, you can contact them. Be a little subtle about it if you suspect an issue. Don't email them and say, I've seen your photo on here. Can I just check whether your journal is predatory? Just ask them why they would recommend um, that specific journal. Do they, um, what does, what's their opinion of kind of the review process? And do they think your research would be right? And see what kind of response you get. Just an extra thing you can do to perhaps check if you're really unsure. A really useful indicator is any kind of connection to a recognised institution. That's normally a good sign. So, for example, Cambridge University Press is affiliated to the University of Cambridge. They are a completely legitimate publisher, I should say at this point, but that, that kind of link there can give you a bit of reassurance. Although, do remember that we said earlier that sometimes this link can be falsely claimed. There can be a subtle shift in names. So Journal of Physics to the American Journal of Physics, that's like cloning. So it always pays to double check. You can have a look at something called the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, to see if it, um, the journal is listed on there. Then um, that will give you an indication that it is a, a decent and legitimate journal. However, having said that, if you don't find it on that list, that's not an automatic red flag. It may just be that it's it's too early or it hasn't been indexed for some reason. It's not doesn't automatically mean it's predatory. It's just another source that you can check. So this one treat with a little bit of caution, but have a little look at the website and this includes the invitation to publish. So look and see if the invitation to publish is well written. Is it? clear and straightforward? Is it written in a good standard of, of English or whatever language it's using? But again, be aware that English may not be the first language of the person who's writing it. A lot of newer journals are published in countries such as India or China, where um, someone may not have English as their first language. Have a look um, for any issues on the website as well. So it, Look at their online presence. Do they have a social media presence? Does it look professional? Does it look like somewhere you would want to publish? Are there errors in spelling or grammar or anything that you might just think care hasn't really been taken here? But do remember that what looks polished and professional to some people is just without out of the reach of journals in some countries, certainly newer ones that are just starting up. And so maybe give them the benefit of the doubt if it's not quite as polished as you were expecting. You can check recognised databases that you regularly use in your research to see if the title is indexed in those. That's usually a good sign if it is. It will need to have met some kind of standard for inclusion in order to be featured in that database. So you can probably go ahead if it's in there. If the actual title isn't available, that might just be because it's too new to have been indexed. Again, it's not an automatic red flag. And you can always have a look for other titles by the same publisher to see if those have been indexed. And hopefully that will give you an idea as well. Perhaps the biggest indicator of quality of a publisher is to have a look at the quality of the previous publications. So look at the titles that they've already published, look at the articles that they've already put out. Are these what you would consider good quality? Would you publish with this publisher? Would you read these articles? Would you want your work sitting alongside this kind of output? And that will probably give you the best um, idea of what kind of publisher these um, firms are. 
Also a good idea to look for any errors in the title or the abstract because this might show that the editors aren't really familiar with the topic. That's very important if you're dealing with something with a very specialist terminology like medical or scientific terminology. Are there mistakes that really shouldn't have slipped through that, that have and that might make you question why those haven't been picked up? If you think back to the Star Wars example we looked at earlier, that's quite a good example of one where anyone with any kind of medical or sci-fi knowledge should have picked that up and raised a red flag and seen that as a problem. So perhaps the most important thing that I can leave you with at the end of this session is to trust your judgment and trust your gut because if something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't and you should probably do some further investigation. It also pays to double check any journal that you're thinking about publishing with, whether you've heard of them or not, because you should really know what you're getting into when you're sharing your work. So whether that be copyright or um, the rights you're allowed to keep or any fees that you're going to pay, you should know what these are for. These are legal documents that you sign when you publish. Having said that, there, there are some tools that you can use. So you can use the checklist that we've just talked about. There's a very good website called Think, Check, Submit. And I believe a parallel one called Think, Check, Present, which um, talks you through a similar checklist for publications or conferences and may help you make some decisions about whether you should use these firms. And also your, your friendly research support librarians are there to help you. And on that note, that is the um, email address for the, the more the Physical Sciences Library um, Research Support Office. Please do get in touch with us with any questions. We are happy to offer any advice on this area, non-judgmental advice. Please don't worry that you may seem silly for asking any of these questions. We are more than happy to help. But for now, that's the end of the session and thanks for listening.